And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a newcomer into the temple. A man, a man, who a man responsible for meant for many works within the within the OSR end of things, and now creating a the white box role playing experience in the Aztec Empire known as Mahahuitil. I am probably going to mispronounce pretty much everything in <laughs> in the next in the next hour, and I'm glad that you have a pronunciation guide in the back. I'll get to that later. The <laughs> one and only the basic expert. Thank you, thank you for having me on. It means a lot to be to be here and, and uh, chat with you. Yeah, thank thank you for coming on and braving the hell that is time zones. <laughs> it's all good. It's been a it's been like the last I don't know ten days have been trying to coordinate schedules with lots of different people. So mm -hmm. at this point, I'm just used to it. Yeah, I can I can relate because well, U.S. time zones are the easiest for me to work with. It's the international stuff where things get interesting. Yeah, yeah. Someone's like five or six or nine hours ahead of you, and you gotta try and coordinate the, <laughs> oh, <it's>, the interview. <laughs> it's even weirder when you're dealing with people across the international date line. Yeah. <laughs> you know the, these the same people who ended up who end up wishing me happy birthday a day before the a day before my actual birthday. <laughs> uh, you know, or it, or the type of people who will will wish you happy holidays even before the holiday even starts. <laughs> like, hold up, bud! I'm not even there yet. <laughs> although, although some of those people, some of those people are in the Philippines, and um, if I did if I did deal with Christmas as long as long as as it happens over there, I would probably fucking die. <laughs> Uh, I like Christmas, but uh, I probably it probably would get old. <laughs> well, do you know how do you know how long it goes? Uh, I'm assuming it's probably too long based on what you're telling, but I don't know the exact number. So, <laughs> three months. Ooh, okay, yeah, that's too long. That's 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 too long. Like I can I can barely hand I can barely handle a week before I before I'm just done with it and I'm turning into Ebenezer Scrooge. I can handle all of December and some of January, but uh, uh, that three months is too long. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh -huh. And I'm, I might be I might be futzing about with the dates, but the thing is, it it goes long, and <laughs> I can and I have my limits. But with that said, I would I would open up with the. Or with the origin stories, as I often do in these situations, but would it be fair of me to say that your first introduction was BX D and D, or was your first introduction um, before even that? Uh, like the first time I ever played the game, or the first introduction to like old school. Um, the first time you played the game, period. First time I played the game was in the dreaded fourth edition, uh, mid two thousands. My you know, wife and girlfriend at the time bought me the box set because I wanted to play, and I was one of those people where like you know you go to the store and you're like I've heard about this D and D thing and I've always been interested in it. I grew up in a very um, religious household where I wouldn't I wasn't allowed to play as a kid. Mm -hmm. uh, the Satanic Panic. I grew up in the '90s. The Satanic Panic was already done, but in my uh, family's church that we attended, it was still kind of going strong there. So I was forbidden from doing it. So as an adult, you know, um, later in life, uh, 20s, in my in my 20s, uh, I was able to play. And so, you know, you go into the store and you go, I want to play D&D. And at the time, 4th edition was the current one, and that was that's what's there, so that's what you get. Uh, I had good times in that, but, you know, I, I did start to, even then, as my first introduction into what this hobby is, I started to see sort of the cracks, the issues with 4th. Uh, yeah, I um, I've I've made it clear I've made it clear that I consider I consider fourth edition to ha to have a degree of um overhate by a lot of people who don't know their history, um, mm -hmm. because the whole the whole the whole MMO complaint complaint um 
I feel I feel like that I feel like that was done kind kind of in the kind of in the same way that people were using Call of Duty as a pro, as a proxy for the entirety of first person shooters, especially since mm -hmm. World of Warcraft was it was at its peak around that time. And mm -hmm. as far as the as far as the video game complaint, um, did everyone just forget about SSI <laughs> <laughs> and and how? Or, or even the D and D module on the Plato engine back in the seventies, um, like D and D and video games have got have gone more have gone more hand in hand than people seem to than people seem to think. Oh, um, well, sure. Like even the Baldur's Gate games, you know, they're they're running a version of Second Edition under the hood in one yeah. and two. You well, know, so SSI, a lot of the SSI and Goldbox games predate um, Baldur's Gate. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Those were. I think I played a couple of those. Probably my parents didn't know what I was doing because again, I wasn't supposed to be allowed to do that. But, uh, but oh. like they bought me, they bought me Baldur's Gate. They didn't know what it was because they just saw like the, the cover with a skull on it, and they're like, "Oh, whatever, that's fine. It's just a fantasy game." Yeah. And I'm like, yeah, that's and, D &D. <laughs> well, I do. I um, I do. I do recall trick. I do recall tricking one one person who was really religious into re into reading a D and D novel without telling him. <laughs> oh, because because fortunately it was hardcover, so I was able to I was able to um, print a print a mockup of of something more generic. Um, and that what I didn't tell him is that he was is that he was reading um <laughs> he was he was reading Dragonlance. I didn't tell, oh. I didn't tell him until he was mid, until he was midway through. He was like I I can't read it I I can't read anything D and D re D and D related. I can't read anything Harry Potter related. So I gave I gave him that book. Then after about two months, I told him, "Yeah, you were reading Dragonlance, and Dragonlance is based on D and D. You're welcome, <laughs> <laughs> because oh, <laughs> I because well, I seem to be the crown prince of pranks." <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, hopefully, hopefully, like like my parents, my parents, um, they lightened up eventually, and they eventually uh, did apologize mm -hmm. for you know that kind of stuff, but yeah. Yeah. Now, it is interesting that of of all the settings to go with, you decided to um, pick doing a Mesoamerican so sword and sorcery. So, I think the next not logical question would be, where did where did you first? How did you first get exposed to this particular time period in this particular um, region? Well, it it's uh it, it's part of my ancestry. Um, I've always been kind of interested in it because of that, knowing that, mm -hmm. even as a kid, you know, like the, the iconography of like an eagle warrior, a jaguar warrior always, always interested me. You know, this is a, it, and then too, like in history, you learn about this kind of stuff. And uh, Mesoamerica was always one of the more interesting parts of world history and, and whatnot in school that really kept me interested. Uh, the typical medieval stuff too, but, um, this was also like it was so different and alien as well and uh there there is like a different definite like mystical element to the mesoamerican culture and their their views and and all that kind of stuff and, and the, the way they viewed the world and so it's and they're a warlike culture mm -hmm. you know, all these all these cultures are like warrior based cultures uh where you know if you want to advance your station in, in society like uh, heroic Heroics on the battlefield are a way to do it, and so it just seemed like a good fit for a, a role-playing game, in my opinion. And I hadn't really seen it done, uh, at least to the extent that I'm trying to do it here before. And I'm I'm the kind of guy that's always looking. I don't want to make like another like pure heartbreaker game. You know, I'm fine with using other established systems like White Box, like old school yeah. D&D uh, rules, but um, I don't want to just do generic fantasy. You know, uh, that that D and D already exists. I have the original three little brown books. I have Advanced Dungeons and Dragons. I have BX. I have I have the versions of D and D that, if I want to play generic European inspired fantasy, I have those. So this just seemed like something cool and interesting that I hadn't seen someone do, and it just seemed to fit really well uh, with with the concept of a, of a role playing game. So I I just started trying to do it and, and write it and make it happen. Which I will I will note just tr just from past experience with these with this kind of thing I am glad that there is a pronunciation guide 
Oh. <laughs> and it's okay. Like I butcher the words too. I've been I've been researching this for two years, and it's still hard. Uh, the the Nahuatl language is is very difficult to pronounce. Well, when you're dealing when you're dealing with with um wording that's going that's going to be in a different vowel that's going to be in a different vowel and consonant structure. Um, yeah. It is going to be difficult. I've I've always likened this kind of thing to um, trying to catch a ball with your opposite hand. And yeah. I'm going to go out on a limb here and say that you are not ambidextrous. I'm left-handed, so I'm like, as most lefties are, you sort of have to be pseudo-ambidextrous. So, uh, <laughs> you know, like, you, you, have to use, you have to use your right hand for some things or else you just can't do certain things. Uh, but I'm not fully, like, I'm not as good with my right hand as I am with my left. So. Yeah. And <laughs> if, I, if I asked you to catch a... To, if I asked you to catch a baseball with your right hand, you'd stumble. Probably. It'd be much more difficult than with my left. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> there were, I've told this story before, but there was an incident in a minor league baseball game where you had, um, two, you had a pitcher and a hitter who were both ambidextrous, and chaos ensued. <laughs> because because they kept sw they kept switching si they kept switching sides and they couldn't agree up. They couldn't. The pitcher would tip pick one side, then the batter would go to the opposite, and then they'd keep repeating until the umps um, came out, stop, and stop the game because, technically speaking, <laughs> they weren't breaking any rules, but they couldn't they're keep doing down. this. Yeah, yeah they're, they're slow. It's slowing everything down. That's funny. Yeah. I... <laughs> this was a, it was a minor league game between a couple t between a couple of New York teams. I think one of them was Staten Island, and one of them w was um, Brooklyn. But it was it was a nothing it was a nothing game at the tail end of the season. It's just it's just you had two people who were both ambidextrous, both both switch positions, and <laughs> the umps had to um, improvise on the fly. And eventually, a rule was put in that the pitcher has priority. Mm. Oh, that's funny. <laughs> so once that once that side has been picked, the batter's got to respond, and you're stuck at that position. <laughs> It's... But yeah, I, I knew with I knew with the book though that I'd have to put a pronunciation guide in because I struggle with it, and I knew that if I spent two years looking at this stuff, researching and trying to like get knowledgeable on this, that mm -hmm. someone who's just picking up the book they're going to struggle with this even worse. So yep. this had this was a must. This was a must that I had to put in. I knew. So <laughs> I hope people get use out of it. And there's a there's a glossary at the back too that shows uh, common words mm -hmm. and their their meaning, and then a phonetic pronunciation as well. Yeah. So very, very helpful if you just study that. And the, the one of the first things you're greeted with in the book, too, is the pronunciation guide of, like, how the X makes the uh, sh sound like a, in she. Mm -hmm. that, that one's really key if you want to pronounce a lot of the Aztec words. But, uh, yeah, I, I, I hope it's useful. <laughs> mm -hmm. And I think the one of the... There's, there are a few. Uh, even though this is built or around white box, there are st there are still a few adi additions that are pre that are present. Um, I mean, there is there is a, there is alignment. Although from from my per from my personal per perspective, I've always used alignment more as a faction allegiance thing than a than anything than anything else. Alignment's one of those weird things that got. Um, put into a morality system with ta with time that it was never built for. Yeah, you know, it's based off of like original, uh, in my opinion, like Michael Moorcock novels. It is. You know, where, you know where the, 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 there's gods of chaos and, and law and stuff, but. And they're both uh, assholes. Yeah, you know, they're not, yeah. They're all pulling strings mm -hmm. and they're not, yeah. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're, they're not. The, the, that alignment, the nine point alignment, is not present in in the the more cocker novels. <laughs> no, he just, no, he just had he just had law and chaos. I'd, if there's an, if there's any um, IP that that has consistently understood the that whole law, that whole law and chaos dichotomy, as heretical as it might be it might be to some OSR types for me to say this, I'd actually say it's the Megami Tensei games. I'm not familiar with those. Um, and I I do want to note that I'm specifically referring to the core games, the Shin Megami Tensei um, se series, not Persona, not Devil Summoner. Well, Devil mm. Summoner might oh. count, but okay. Within it, you 
there there are within the main ones there are always two major factions that show up um there is the there there is the which are um represented through law and chaos um law tends to manifest through the messianic cult and you do and al always is preaching order but that order can can go full, can go into full on fascism in the ex in the extreme cases. Sure. Um, yeah, yeah. On the other end, you have the chaos. You have chaos being represented by the Gaia cult, which is prioritizing freedom, but some but the extreme ends w want not just freedom but full on anarchy. Uh, the mm -hmm. a, the whole the whole um, the might is right to its logical extreme. Um, and usually the best ending is through rejecting both of them, much like how yeah. Elric, by the by the end of his by the end of the of his story, um, he had rejected both um, law and chaos. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, you know, and I, I tried to kind of play off that idea a little bit because this is D and D, and it's old school D and D under the hood. So I felt like alignment needed to be there, and to me, it just seemed good or it seemed logical to overlay it over do you as the character support the status quo of the aztec society do you as a player are, are, are you neutral to it or are you someone trying to tear it down mm -hmm. and um you know uh that that seemed to make the most logical sense as far as overlaying that old school mechanic over something that it's never really been overlaid before i think so uh I'm sure some people, most people ignore alignment. Alignment, they'll probably ignore that too. But I felt like I needed to cover and include it and provide some sort of explanation in it, um, despite people probably ignoring it. <laughs> I think it, I, I honestly think that a lot that alignment gets ignored so often because there isn't enough of a reason to use it. No. Uh, like if if it was if it was a case where your choice of alignment would. Uh, would affect would affect characterization or or affect the type of um, interactions you'd have with with NPCs and th then you'd probably see people use it more often. But once it comes once you get down to actual play, um, alignment doesn't matter all that much. And I I know some people bring up the the way a the the X classes that um that got used in say th in say third edition as well, as well as Pathfinder to an extent. That is not the solution. That is, in fact, trading one problem with another problem. Oh. <laughs> I mean, within old school, you have some classes like you, you, alignment will matter more to like a cleric or a paladin, specifically a paladin, because if you yeah. don't follow your your alignment, you're going to lose your powers. Yeah, the, but... which leads to them having a mandated reason to be a dickhead. Sometimes, yeah, you know that. I think that's why paladin is sort of gate kept in AD and D by harder to roll uh, ability scores right so you know it's it's kind of they're rare they're they're generally if someone's going to be a, a martial character they're going to be like a fighter or something maybe they'll get to be a ranger too but those are rare as well yeah but rangers um, su rangers sucked in old school <laughs> they're not too bad i mean at the table in play i i ran an ad and d game and uh one of the players was a ranger and he did he did pretty well he did okay I mean, he had a good time at least. Seeing, I don't know. It it'll probably varied from player to player, Ran from table to table. Ranger, there's a reason Ranger Down became a became a running joke, <laughs> <laughs> and I don't have any proof of it, but it's speculated that that's that um the reason the reason why more forgiving um death mechanics started coming in was because of how easy the Ranger could die, mm. um, because they could because they couldn't equip heavy armor and a lot of their kit didn't exactly work in dungeon. Which in dungeons, which I think is also the reason nobody plays Cavalier because it's kind of hard to get away with their <laughs> kit. With in a in the in the case of a ranger, it's kind of hard to do outdoorsy stuff in a game called Dungeons and Dragons. And the Cavalier, a lot of his kit is built around being being mounted, and kind of hard to do that in a dungeon. Yeah, I mean, my player wanted to be a ranger, and I guess it it worked out. Uh... But, you know, I run games where there's an equal amount of, of overland travel and dungeon delving when I do it. Like, it's not all 
it, the, the dungeon is obviously a big focus. It's a you big don't part. strike me as somebody who would run Tomb of Horrors. <laughs> I don't own Tomb of Horrors. I, I generally, I don't really use modules all that much. Um, if I'm running AD and D, I usually play first edition, and I run a lot of games out of the appendices in the back. You know, I, I definitely run like a a seat of the pants style kind of game. You know, where uh, I don't go into much prep, um, and I sort of just I I get I have fun with that though because for me I I enjoy the the play back and forth between me contributing to the world and the players contributing to the world and us responding to each other like that that's fun to me and that's part of the the game of being a, a good ref. Um, not always successful at it, but that's just where I, I maintain interest. Yeah. So that that's generally how I run my games. I, so I don't use I don't use modules all that much, but death death could be pretty common in uh, in my games. When I ran eight eighty and D a while back, like I think I had a at least one character death every session for the first five or six. They kept rolling up new characters. They didn't under they made terrible mistakes, so it wasn't my fault. They uh Refused to get hirelings. They refused to get uh, people in their employ, and uh, they made terrible decisions, like the cleric successfully turning undead and then deciding to chase them down the hallway by himself after they ran away. So you know stuff like that. They they sort of deserved it, I guess. <laughs> uh, maybe, maybe. But with the with that set with that said, um. One of the other th one of the other things that I'd be I'd be rem I'd be remiss if I did if I didn't bring up is the is the the introduction of zodiac signs mm -hmm. as a, as a pl as a player um el as a player element and well the only bad thing I have to say I have to say about it is the fact that I have to turn my head sideways for yeah. for this. I'm hope. I, I did, do you have plans I, on putting the zodiac signs in its own um, document? Well, I want to make like a, a quick reference sheet where you know a lot of the tables because it's going to be a digest sized book. So making some of these tables that were very large fit without having to spill onto another page, I didn't want to do that. So I, ha I had to do some less than desirable layout choices like that. But uh, I do want to provide like maybe a free PDF that will have like uh, all the tables and charts on in one document that you could just print up and reference you know that would be like on an eight and a half eight and a half by eleven sheet so it'd be a bigger sheet It'd be able to fit more information on there and uh almost you could slip them into like your dm screen or something like that too if you're using that, that that's that's the plan yeah because it isn't a case where you're pick where you're picking a zodiac sign in the traditional sense you are um you're pick you're picking you're picking the phase the uh, the lucky day and the unlucky day. Um, yeah, you're rolling a d20 for the vertical and horizontal column and where they meet. That's where, uh, that's that's the day that you're born on. Not necessarily the day you're named on. It could you could choose that day that you rolled if it's favorable and you like it. You can do that. Mm -hmm. uh, but the the zodiac sign is going to be wherever they intersect to go up to day one. And the first sign that is day one that is the zodiac date for that. Uh, phase for that uh, Tresenia. and the that could be a good good phase. It could be a bad phase. Mm -hmm. Same with the the number of the day. You know, uh, certain days were lucky, certain, some were unlucky. I tried to make them at least interesting, though, uh, at least, especially on the lucky and unlucky days, to make it so that it's um, even if you got an unlucky thing, it would still be something interesting to maybe role play or ammo for the referee to give you um, plot hooks and quests and stuff like that. Uh, so I I would encourage people, even if you get a an unlucky thing, uh, you have no way of, of changing that. Because you can, you can shift the day by four days. Parents in Aztec society could wait four days to name their child for a more fortuitous uh, sign or day. Uh, so you can do that as your character as well. Uh, but even, but I, I've been in playtesting. I've had characters that rolled up where, like, even the four days, you're still kind of screwed. Like, you might end up out of a bad uh, tresenia, but you might still end up on an unlucky day or something like that mm -hmm. in order for that to happen. So it, it makes for an interesting dynamic, I think. And I, I hope people have fun with it and, and, and uh, don't just pick. You know, the Aztecs didn't get to pick the day they were born, so uh, I don't want characters to be able to do that either, necessarily. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Now, 
that bring that brings me into the classes. And mm-hmm. what I'd like to do with this is kind of go is kind of go into um each of each of the classes and what and what they and um what sort of an at what sort of an analog would be, what sort of what sort of um play style would they appeal would they appeal to? Since you're gonna have people coming into this who pro- who are probably playing um probably playing BX or or Beckme or and or any of any of the innumerable retro clones. So mm-hmm. it's it's one of those things worth exploring. Um Sure. So I'll start with the Eagle Warrior. The Eagle Warrior is sort of like a scout. He's kind of a mix. I mean, we just got done talking about rangers. He's kind of a mix between a, a ranger and a, and a thief in some respects, but with a little bit more fighting ability uh, in, in some other ways. Mm-hmm. Uh, this is He doesn't get as good of um, an attack bonus progression as, to say, the Jaguar Warrior, but he does get some Eagle Warrior skills. They were, they were generally used as scouts in the army. They're also uh, protectors of the Emperor and whatnot. So they're good at like tracking. They're good at, um, they, and I put things on a D6. I didn't go percentile like what was in Supplement One with Greyhawk, with uh, thief skills or an AD and D or or in the in the basic or expert box sets where everything's on a percentile roll. Um, one thing I liked that Matt Finch did, which I borrowed from and was influenced by, was in his white box Fantastic Medieval Adventure game. He put the thief skills on a D6, and you just have like a success range of you know, on a roll of 1 to 2 at level 1, you're going to be successful at what you're trying to do. And then as you level up, that range will increase mm-hmm. until you're you're pretty much almost guaranteed to succeed. There will still be a chance of failure, but uh, it'll be minimal. Mm-hmm. And uh, I, I just thought that's just easier for a lot of players. And I like, I like that smoothness of it. It's not necessarily traditional, but I feel like it's within... It's taking other mechanics that are within... Uh, OD and D and BX like surprise on a D six or um, do- forcing doors and stuff and applying it someplace else and I I think it, I've always thought that that mechanic worked really well but yeah this is gonna be a, a class for a character that maybe wants to be a little sneaky they want to scout they they'll be the one to go ahead of maybe the party and, and um, see if they can make contact with the enemy uh, that that sort of stuff mm-hmm. um, so next is the Jaguar Warrior. This guy's like the, he's pretty much a fighter, um, like the fighter class. He he is good at, uh, I, I gave him some, a few extra things. So he has like the, the traditional ability of doing extra attacks against one hit die creatures. As he gains levels, he's going to get more attacks against one hit die enemies. But uh, I also gave him some bonus attacks to higher hit die creatures as he progresses, I think at level 4 and 7. Um, I mean, he's just he he's just that cool guy. He gets to wear like the best armor that's in the in the jaguar clothes, uh, jaguar war suits, and everything. Mm-hmm. And that's the best the best the best armor. Uh, he he has access to all weapons. Uh, he's just an all around martial good martial character. Best hit die progression um, out of all the classes. Uh, so. You know, this is this is for the the broody smash smash person that wants to to play that sort of thing. Um, I generally like those kinds of classes. I know people kind of take a dump on fighters and say they're easy or stupid or something, but I I think fighters are fun. So when it comes to the whole when it comes to the whole easy fighter thing, which is some which is something that I've um I've I've I have attempted to address in my own way. Um, I think I think it comes I think it comes down to a few things. One of them is a lot of people a lot of people um, look looking at looking at the character as, as if all all you're do all you're doing is ju- is just basic attack and nothing else, which is which is certainly a potential issue. Um, but I'd say the other, and th- and this is this is a f- this is a far bigger thing to address is. A lot of people having this idea that combat and role playing are mutually exclusive, mm-hmm. and that is some, that is something that I've seen I've seen from both from both old school and new and non old school types. Although so, although some people will insist that it's one type over the other and not and not and not admit fault, but uh, 
But the point the point is is that is that a lot of people seem seem to have this idea that you are you can't do role playing in combat when you look at so you look at so many you look at so many works and you can have so much storytelling within a fight scene. Oh, um, that yeah, within well within within this you know you you could try and say like uh, as a let's say as a jaguar warrior you know, you're you're in there you have your your multiple attacks against one hit die creatures you know. And this isn't an ability on your character sheet, but let's say you want to you want to rush in there, you take out like two or three of these warriors because you're higher level, and um, you you tell the referee like after after taking these out, I want to really try and intimidate these other warriors, these these like peon warriors, you know, these, that uh, with with my with my bru brutality, you know, I want to try and like growl or or whatever, you know, like. Uh, you're going to try to intimidate these guys, and you're you're there trying to enforce or force a, a morale check, maybe let's say, you know, through role play. And I think that's entirely plausible, and more plausible for like a fighter to do that than say like a magic user to run in and try and do the same thing. Obviously, like it it's, it it provides a different um, opportunity for a role play element that is not necessarily an ability on your character sheet, but is still pertinent to your character. And that's part of what I, I like about old school is it it really leans into there's limited stuff on your character sheet, right? So it really leans into player braveness and ability in order to gain the advantage in the situation. And as a GM, I, I reward that kind of stuff. I think that's important when the player's being creative and they want to do something like what I just described, like I'll roll with it. That sounds cool. Let's do it. So uh, yeah, you just gotta kind of think outside the box a little bit with the, the simple tools that you have. You're able to do a lot, lots of really cool stuff. Yeah. Still, in my opinion, um, that that sort of freeformness I've always seen as a, as a double edged sword, because it's it's one of it's one of those things where what it well, um, the analogy I use is what if you gave a war and nobody came, um, <laughs> mm. but moving past that, we have the um. Poctea, and I prop and once and once again I apologize for mispronunciation. <laughs> it's all good. Uh, Pachteca. Pachteca. Uh, yeah, this is like a merchant class. There's not really, I would say, a, within traditional D and D, at least in White Box or BX, it's not really like a an analog for this. It's definitely more of a face class, very specific to this setting. Diplomancy. Uh, yeah, he he's in for he's a, he's a spy. He does diplomacy. He does he gets deals. He's a smooth talker. Or she, I'd, you can be a you can be a female Pashteka as well. I'd say the clo the closest analog. Oh my! Take away the spell casting would probably be bards. That is mm. a massive massive stretch. I'm I'm fully aware, but um. Who else? Well, the bard, the bard is the bard is known for his social skills, and, and this this class and definitely bards, has that. Ca bards have been employed as spies, so mm -hmm. you so you've got so two out so two out of three ain't bad. It's just a lot of people. A lot of people. One of the, one of these days, I will end up doing. I'll end up doing a more detailed thing on the um, misunderstandings that people have with bards. And this is once again, this isn't a old school or new school thing. Both both camps have both camps fall into this trap. Um, the bi the big one is assuming that the bard has to be in that trobador archetype and has to use an instrument. Mm -hmm. um, there's been there's been a lot of focus on the whole. You you need to have that instrument. You need to be like a trobador. But the an, the one of the big inspirations for bards was was um, Nordic skalds. Yeah, poets and, essentially. <laughs> yeah, the the concept of the warrior poet and a lot of and the focusing on the instrument as if that's the source of it is kind is kind of missing the point when bards are supposed to be um, storytellers first and foremost. Mm -hmm. um, this is. Oddly, this is oddly enough. That's one. That's something that um, fourth edition, I think, understood. <laughs> mm. um, because so so many of it, so many of its power, so many of its powers and description was was rooted in using the using that collective power of storytelling in a tangible form. Yeah, at some point, somewhere along the line, like that communication was lost at some point where a bard. 
went from being a little more, I guess, uh, historically authentic to like a court jester. I think it got confused with a court jester of some sort or something like that. It's something similar to that, I guess, you know, where a little more flamboyant, a little more out there. And oh. that, that and, and to a degree, I don't even know if Gary really knew what to do with Barnes either because he stuck him in the appendix of 1E, you know. It's like, I don't know what to do with this. We'll put it over here in the, in the appendix, you know. Uh, in the back of the book, it's not with their other classes. So... <laughs> Um, I think it. I look at that as as a consequence of you know being being built on the back of, um, of that of the war gaming scene from the seventies, and in that kind of situation, where you, where you'd put a where you would put a bard in an army is, actually no, I I can't even use that excuse because every army had a drummer boy, <laughs> 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 whose job it was to re to. Rel to relay commands ac across the army, so no, even even that doesn't work. <laughs> um, but I I I always I always question make making them. Um, I think I think the prob I think the problem is when you're doing a game based on cl based around classes, it's kind of hard to fit in a, a someone who's meant to be a jack of of multiple trades, which is why. But regardless yeah. of edition, Gish characters have had a um, problem. You either you either have them being underpowered or overpowered. Looking at you, Elf. No, I'm not, and I will never ever let that go. <laughs> <laughs> elves, early elves were ridiculously OP. They were. They were. They were pretty. They were pretty powerful. Uh, but when but when you're trying to but the. Well, think think of the bard. They're supposed to be relative. They're supposed to be modestly good at a fight, but not gonna, but not going to outfight a fighter. They're supposed to have a, have some have some skill use, but not as much as a thief. They're supposed. they you you have this kind of no man's land that they're, that they're put that they're put in when you ha when you focus on the one thing that they're supposed that a class is supposed to be good at. Yeah, I think what it is is like when you're in a class-based, level-based game, there's a lot of niche protection that's got to go on. And so when you start introducing a class that can kind of do a little bit of everything, you end up kind of sometimes making it suck because you can't let it step on the toes of the fighter, you can't let it step on the toes of the magic user, you can't let it step on the toes of the thief I think uh, or that, the cleric. I think that's you know? why you saw the shift to the Diplomancer archetype because that was that was a itch that wasn't getting scratched anywhere else. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's still limited when it comes when it comes to doing dungeon crawls, but it is a but it is a niche that you can um, reasonably ex reasonably explore. Just um, well, we I have I have a rule that anyone who tries to do any of that seducing the dragon bullshit um, has to drink the pain glass. <laughs> What's the pain glass? It is a shot glass filled with water, salt, sea salt, pepper, black pepper. Tabasco sauce, Frank's red hot sauce, um, <laughs> sir, sriracha, um, gr gr um, ground up ground up habanero, and oh, and and some chopped up jalapeno seeds. That sounds awful. <laughs> the uh, the other option is drinking a bottle of bacon soda. Oh, that sounds that. Yeah, that, those are both gross. <laughs> well, it's a it's a punishment. It's not supposed it's not supposed to be yeah. nice. But um, the next one on the list is the Nahuali, and I once again I'm. You got it. I think that was pretty good. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, the Nahuali is like a a mix between a, a magic user and a cleric. He's like a cleric in that within Aztec society, he's a he's a priest, mm -hmm. a form of, form of a priest, and all the spells he has access so if you have access to level one or level two spells you in theory have access to all the spells you don't have a spell book necessarily that you're you're keeping around uh trying to write spells in because they didn't have books mm -hmm. so um it, it's 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 a mix between the two uh but again uh the spell casting it's still the Vancian spell slot system, but I add a different mechanic over it, which then Wahali will have to do in order to try and uh, petition the gods for his daily spells, which will take time and could take lots of time. 
uh, depending on the zodiac sign and the temperament of the gods. It's not a reaction role mechanic. Uh, then Walhalla, you can offer sacrifices, uh, both of human and other things, too, um, if he wishes to try and gain a boon to his, his reaction role in order to get the spell that he desires. But um, that, w that was my way of sort of balancing everything with it. He also has a shape-shifting ability. Uh, I'm still tweaking that ability a little bit, uh, but um, he's able to shapeshift into like a jaguar, a dog, a, a turkey, a ghost woman, mm -hmm. or an owl. And these were traditional things that the Aztecs believed that a, a Nagual or a Nuhali sorcerer was able to do. Um, so uh, he, he's kind of, I don't know, he's kind of a druid in that regard, I guess, because the druid has his, you know, shapeshifting as well. So he's, he's he's kind of an amalgam of a couple different classes. Although druid and cleric have always been linked together as well, especially with like VX or Rule Cyclopedia, you have to be a cleric in order to become a druid. Yeah, but, um, I remember I remember not being a fan of how druids were ha were handled at, um, er, early on. I I'm one of those people who vastly prefers druids as their own class rather than um, sandwiching them with a with the cleric because there's some some of the some of the kit like tur like turning and the, and the like just doesn't fit um druids in my opinion yeah i think what make does make that concept cool within like the old cyclopedia both with druids and paladins because they're both like sort of uh, named level classes that you can sort of take is that when you're in a game and the players run across a druid or a paladin they know that this is a this is a badass dude, you know? Like, this is someone not to mess with. It's a mm. paladin. Like, we know he's at least ninth level, or or it's a druid. We know this is at least ninth or 10th level. So, um, I, I think that's a cool little touch, but I get not liking it as well. Uh, you know, AD&D didn't have that. You could just be those things uh, from the, from the get-go. Mm -hmm. um, and, and obviously, in this, I didn't get keep any, like, prestige paths paths like that down for the levels it's just you know you get it <laughs> yeah and plus whenever it comes to the whole you have to get this thing in order to get in order to get that thing um some sometimes that creates false choice yeah and it gets players thinking my gripe with that is with the two character building kind of stuff is players are thinking about what they want to be like 10 levels from now and they make choices within their character. Maybe maybe the party really needs them to make this specific choice, and that would be really beneficial for the party, but it's not aligned with what they envision themselves being, and so they don't take it. And so the, the adventuring party overall is a little bit uh, underpowered because they're aiming for this specific thing, you know, levels down the line, and who knows if they're gonna actually make it there, you know? Uh, so I, I think that for me that's that's part of it as well is is you start making choices for the future when and you start neglecting choices as a player in the present that might be a little more optimized for what the group actually needs at the moment. Mm -hmm. Now next is the Otomi mercenary and I will I will admit look looking into it um, I ended. I ended up being reminded of I ended up being reminded of of, of similar um, mercenary type type of positions that were that were used in say the Hundred Years War like the the uh, the ever fun to say Lanschnecht. <laughs> <laughs> not in terms of kit but in terms of they're they're in they're fight they're fighting for they're fighting for the pay and they're ex and um they're expect they're expected to be a little bit more expendable than regular soldiers. Yeah, the the Atomi were very. They were. It's interesting. They were actually well regarded within Aztec society. They were not um, Mexica ethnically themselves. Mm -hmm. uh, in a lot of respects, there was obviously, of course, lots of intermarrying between a lot of these tribes and stuff like that. But generally, they were not of the Mexica tribe, uh, which is what Mexica is what the Aztecs called themselves. But uh, they were very good warriors. Uh, very good warriors. Uh, they were good with bows. They were good at. Uh, they they were just very useful to the Aztecs. The Aztecs definitely part partnered with them pretty early on. And so while they were oftentimes mercenaries working for the empire, 
Uh, they were well treated. They were well respected, and I, I, I think the Aztecs knew what they had in them, and so they, they gave, they did give them like a special place of honor, despite being uh, warriors. They were, they were a bit more, um, they were pretty elite, I guess, because this is the word culture, you know. So anyone who can, can, can slay a lot of enemies and bring lots of, uh, you know, sacrifice victims back home, uh, that person was to be respected. So it, it's an interesting little tightrope to walk, I guess. But uh, the, the, these guys are more, they don't really have an analog either. I guess they're, they're, they get a bonus to bows. They're just like a better version of the fighter. And it's gate kept behind uh, having to roll some better ability scores because I like classes like that. I think that kind of stuff's neat. It makes those kind of characters a little bit more rare. And when a character's able to become one, um, it feels good. So uh, they're a little better than the Jaguar Warrior in, in a lot of respects, but they you gotta you gotta earn it with some good rolls on your ability scores and your attribute scores. Mm -hmm. uh, next is the Shorn one. This guy is kind of more equivalent to like a paladin. He does get spell cast and eventually. These guys were like within Aztec society were often considered the best of the best. These were like the elite, high level warriors. Uh, very much feared uh, on the battlefield, and they, you know, they separate themselves out with specific haircuts, which is where they get their name. Mm -hmm. um, the, their own little religious cults and, and uh, fraternity of, of warriors and everything that was very elite and exclusive. Uh, and so, again, this is another class though that you have to roll uh, better uh, ability scores in order to get. It's it's not something. You're generally going to probably, if you want to be a more martial character, you're going to be like a, a jaguar warrior or, or probably a, an eagle warrior, more likely than either the Atomi or the short one. Mm -hmm. And especially since, especially since they, um, the you have you have it, you have you have a you have it where the, where they're a bit they're. I'd say pro I'd say probably probably the most de probably the most demanding when it comes to uh, when it comes to ability scores of the of the yes. ones I've we've talked about thus far. Um, yeah, they're definitely they're definitely top tier. Like you gotta you gotta be a very extraordinary character in some respects with the, the requirements in order to become one. Mm -hmm. Um. Now. Obvious, obviously, we're de we're dealing with me with weapons made of stone, w wood, and obs and obsidian, which all is another type of stone. So you, I remember on the Kickstarter you had talked about a d about putting in a system to cover durability because well, um, the well with so the aspects of these weapons aren't exactly meant to last, especially the ev the ever famous Mahahuitil where the Obsid where the obsidian um, shards that are within it, yeah, th yeah, they can be very sharp. And they can take somebody's head off, but they're not exactly durable. Mm -hmm. Very sharp, but very. I mean, it's glass. It's it's very fragile. It could it'll it'll snap snap and shatter very easily. Um, the way I went about it is essentially on a missed hit. If you miss, the GM, the referee is going to roll a d6, a roll of one. Your weapon's broken. You're going to get a minus one damage. Mm -hmm. um, players can try to purchase or or gain prismatic blades through their uh, resources, or uh, they they can carry around uh, a an obsidian core. Like that was what they were called. They were just like these ch chunks of obsidian, and then you you flake off prismatic blades from it, and you could get like hundreds and hundreds of blades from a single core. Uh, so obviously they're a bit more expensive. But uh, I'm kind of I kind of like to mess with, with with players a little bit in that you know the player can determine if they're going to make a repair and then once again the the GM the referee is going to make a roll to see if, secretly if the repair is successful mm -hmm. and if it's not the next time the player character swings like it, it, it there's a chance it might break again if it wasn't successful so because um, they they would you you know these blades were fixed into their weapons with pine resin and and things like that so. Even the glue that was holding the stuff in it wasn't it wasn't like industrial glue or anything like that. You know, it was good enough, but uh, good enough for the weapon versus weapon that they were using in warfare. Mm -hmm. uh, 
but yes, they, these were not these were weapons that were not designed to last. They were made from very fragile materials, and hence a lot of warriors would carry prismatic blades and things like that to make quick field repairs on their weapons. This damage would be uh, given to them. Yeah. Um, something that I find a bit a bit interesting is instead of having experience points, for one, you have status points. But mm-hmm. that's also used as your as your equivalent of, um, of of the standard metal currencies. Yeah, so you got a single currency that is used for both leveling up and for purchasing equipment, hirelings. If you want to build a stronghold, any a temple, any of that kind of stuff, uh, you're going to use your status points, and it makes players make a choice. Uh, they they have to decide. Do I want to spend these points on leveling up my character, or do I want to buy some new armor? Do I want to get some some uh, commoner warriors underneath me that will follow me into battle? What do I want to do? Um, because the thing I struggled with is OD and D, Zero E, EX, AD and D. These were all gold for XP games, and the Aztecs didn't have coinage. They had things called hoe money. Uh, tajaderas, they were called by the Spanish, but they look like they look like little axe heads. They're made of like hammered copper and other metals like that. Mm. Uh, but it there, there wasn't super prevalent. And the Aztec society was very much more a barter society. They would trade quachtuni, which is like a standard measurements of cloth, cocoa beans, corn, you know, uh, produce, other things like that. They they exchanged in those things. And so it just gold, gold and gems just wasn't going to work for this. If I wanted the setting to feel, I, I I felt like that would just stick out like a sore thumb. And so I thought like, well, I just have to abstract this out because what really mattered in Aztec society was your social status. And so having sort of an abstracted point system that was essentially XP reskinned to function as a currency seemed to be the best design choice in my opinion. Mm-hmm. Uh, in order to, because because XP these sorts of things these are designed, uh, and gold for XP does this very well. It it really encourages players to go out there, go deeper into the dungeon, make greater w- risks every time they go out there, and that's where the fun of the game happens, right? And so to remove that, you have to replace it with something else that is going to equally motivate players to want to get out there and risk their characters' lives for the fun of the game. And uh, so that's what I tried to do with this. So later in the book, I do offer like a table that shows, you know, uh, capture someone alive, get five times their status point value instead of just the base value for killing them. If you're fighting another warrior, let's say, because uh, you're bringing them back for sacrifice. Or maybe you're defending against uh, an attack against your city, or maybe you're raiding the city or raiding the village or something like that. So I try and give uh, point values for doing certain things, certain actions within the game that an Aztec warrior themselves would be motivated to do. Uh, and and playtesting, it's it's worked out pretty good. Um, I, I've had some fun situations where my players, I've talked about this on other streams, my players uh, were... this. I ran my playtest prior to the Triple City Alliance, so Tejkoko was not part of the Triple City Alliance. It was just Tenochtitlan uh, was the only one. And the players wanted to raid uh, Tejkoko. And they had to think. They're like, they had enough to where they could level up their characters, or they could. Uh, some of them could level up, and they could also put some towards a war canoe. Mm-hmm. And they they were like, well, let's have some of us level up, and then we'll buy a war canoe, because then we can bring back more potential uh, sacrifice victims, and and that way level up even get more status, and we can level up then. You know, we just got to be careful in the raid if. You know, however, however that goes down, and so I, I thought that was neat, and that was exactly the sort of decision making I wanted to sort of foist on the on the players as they were uh, playing the game, is to work how to allocate their influence in order to level themselves up, get gear, get followers, whatever it might be. Mm-hmm. So, with the, now with that in mind, the. I, I suppose one of the big one of the big questions to ask is that obviously obviously there's going to be a lot of appeal in in doing dungeon crawls given the, given the setting that that you're working with um, I can I can see hex crawls work 
I can see hex crawls being done, but how, but um, how do you handle the idea of doing a dungeon crawl within the within this? I mean, that's there. I, I've I've mentioned on other streams. I was on Brian Howard's stream last last night, and I talked about how uh, the Aztecs had a different view of, of subterranean world than adventures would in a traditional game. Uh, so they've used caves as like wombs into the earth, and that's probably what they would play. And there wouldn't really be like subterranean flagstone made dungeons and stuff like that. But there would be caves, and a lot of these caves, again, they, they viewed them as sacred. Uh, this is where like the, some of the gods resided in. Um, so there is potential to go in there. You could potentially, say, have a cave that goes to Miklon, the underworld. A warrior wouldn't want to go there unless they really had a good reason to do so, though. But you could also do. There were there were precursor civilizations, and there, there they believed in there was multiple suns before them. So in theory, you could still, if you wanted to have something of a traditional dungeon crawl, you could say that there's a, a pyramid there buried from the, the, you know, the sun before, you know, the the, the people of the sun before it built. What's in there? We can go. If we can get some artifacts to bring them back to the emperor. And the emperor can, because um, the Aztecs were masters of propaganda. They changed their history themselves quite often, uh, destroyed their own history, and then rewrote it quite often uh, to to make themselves obviously seem better than they really were uh, in the eyes of their neighbors. Mm -hmm. So getting getting an artifact and having it tie back to the emperor could be a, a, an adventure that you could easily tie into the setting and make it work. The way I ran it though was mostly wilderness adventures. Lots of battles and conflicts with opposing warriors, with the occasional creepy supernatural creature that would appear um, as a as a problem uh, within within that every once in a while. Uh, so, you, dungeon delving isn't quite as big of a uh, of a deal, but you could do it. There's some precedence for it, but I envision this being more of like an overland hex. Uh, warfare type game where you're raiding enemy camps, you're attacking enemy cities, uh, you maybe you're infiltrating uh, with subterfuge and uh, trying to relay, relay false information with your Pachteca or, or things like that, you know. Um, I guess maybe a little more political in some mm -hmm. respect uh, with, with combat thrown in there every once in a while. Yeah. So, and yeah. A bit of, a bit of an aside because I do appreciate the. Um, the app the appendix B that you put in regarding resources and for and further res further research basically you're equivalent to appendix N, but in the in the spirit of that I'm cu I'm curious if you've ever heard if you've um ever heard of a band named called um Semicon. Oh yeah, I, yeah, they're pretty good. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I ha I had to br I had to bring that up because. Studying that, studying that put me down a put me down a rabbit hole of the, of this sort of the sort of Mesoamerican death metal, and then I I found out that there's a that there were a bunch of different um, yeah. acts that were in, that were um, in in similar approaches, and well, Semican managed to perform at Vaken, which it, which is the well. You man, you managed to make it if you if you're performing at the biggest, um, um, open open air concert ven concert venue on the planet. Yeah, I saw the live video of that. I thought it was cool that you know they played to the to the roots of the the culture, and I love that they had like the guy dressed up like a like a god who was bringing the slave out and swinging his mahuito uh, at him and whatnot. I think it was that one. Uh, pretty sure it was that one. But, uh, yeah. yeah, they're pretty good. I like Azadlan. That's another band that's pretty mm -hmm. good. Uh, they 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 write some good stuff. There's one other one I always forget their name, but they're a little more like melodic, uh, with growls every once in a while. They're a pretty good band. Yeah. But, um, I'd also be remiss if I didn't bring up Tierra Mystica, even if they haven't done done a whole lot in the last few years. I haven't listened to them before. I've I've never heard of that before. I'll have to look that up. Um. Tierra Mystica is, I'd, I'd say, more more power than de than death. Mm. Um, Sound, their name kind of to me implies that. <laughs> yeah, because 
the last th they they've done a couple they did a couple singles a couple years ago, but they haven't done a full album since um, 2013. Uh. And I think I'm and um go, just going through just going through this kind of thing um is it is a is a rabbit hole and i'm always i always try and look for music to 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 help if to help estab to help establish kind of the voice of the of this of a particular campaign um like any anytime i do a campaign i'm always writing a primer which is meant to be this this general approach of how th of how things are of how I expect things to work. Not necessarily saying, "Oh, this is how you're supposed to play," but if I'm running, say, Lex Arcana, I'd make and I've done I've done this in the past. I made it explicitly clear. You get you guys you guys are investigators of the of the supernatural on behalf of the em on behalf of the Empire. Do not mm -hmm. go. Do not go in thinking you're going to be doing you're going to be doing gladiator or Spartacus shit. You're not you're not you're not doing that. You're doing X, you're doing X Files in ancient Rome. <laughs> and, I, I love Lex Arcana. That's a great game. <laughs> and I, I that's not that's not this. I didn't stop anybody from making a combat centric character. I just warned them if you're doing a combat centric character in this campaign, you're gonna be the third wheel a lot. Yeah. Because, you know, it's that's that's what I mean when I when I say setting up a primer to give people an expectation on what to do and what not to. Because if you yeah. if you get if you get told that you're that you're that everybody's running a fantasy game and you make a fighter and then it turns out we're running Game of Thrones, you're gonna be sitting yeah. sitting sitting with your thumb up your ass most of the campaign. <laughs> Want me to swing my sword? Not yet. <laughs> oh. I I know some I know somebody might ar might argue that you could that you could you could make you could make it work, um. But if your if you, if your character is built towards combat and they have to be in a, a lot of social situations, there's going to be long amounts of them rolling like shit. There's no yeah. getting around that. I think that's what's interesting about like. Uh old school games though you know you have a simple reaction roll mechanic that you can use but most of the time like it's just handled in in free form role playing you know um, and and i i kind of appreciate that and and a, and a game master in, in those instances and what i do is, is i take into account what their score is you know white box has like it is interesting about white box too it's like your scores don't really matter all that much not as much as in later versions of the game Right, like the best you're getting is a plus one, the worst you're getting is a minus one, um, and so I think that sort of frees up players to maybe play a little bit more flawed characters, but also um, mm. engage in role playing. I I understand it's a taste thing, and to me, like the way I run a lot of my games is I don't really call for roles all that much. In that, what I, I call for roles in a situation where I'm not sure what the outcome would be or me and the player are negotiating essentially when we come to an impasse and it's like okay now we need to roll for something but um yeah i don't know i i, I really lean into like that 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 uh that role played element in some in, in those instances yes yeah, um my approach is my approach has always been to always been to um to find to find a middle ground between between ro between role play and narrative again I don't see those two things as as mutually exclusive as as a mm -hmm. lot of people do um, at the same at the same time I've I've seen some people excuse excuse say the the ridiculous the ridiculous mechanics in 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 say in say rifts or um or or yeah. so, or some other projects of oh you oh you just need to role play more and I'm like I can I can get that but I th but the I think the text needs to provide people a good, provide people a good reason to um to do it instead of a lot of people seem to have this idea that the best way to teach people because well before before I became a podcaster I was a teacher um mm. is to is the equivalent of pushing somebody into the pool and saying swim damn it now drown less. 
<laughs> Which, yeah, I, I know there's romanticism in in sink or swim, but there can be just, but there can be just as much um, frustration. Um, this is the reason why flow theory is is something that's brought up in game design. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I I'll say like in this and and the way I run my games too, I'm one of those also one of those GMs that leans into reaction roles a lot more, and I sort of use them more than just like combat encounters and parlaying, you know, uh, and I think that's what's neat about old school too, is that like there's no real like social skill mechanic, but you could easily take a mechanic that's already within the rules and sort of overlay it over another situation without too much trouble. Yeah. And it, and it will work fairly well, you know. Oh, okay, it's a 2d6 roll uh, for a reaction roll, you know, the reaction roll table, and we're going to add your charisma modifier to the roll or, or mm -hmm. penalty to the roll, you know. Uh, there you go. You now you have a social skill system, pretty much still in, inbuilt into the game, you know. And when it says hostile or attack, like obviously if you're talking to the to the merchant or something like that, the merchant's not going to pull out his pitchfork and try and stab the player. But you know, the, the merchant might be like, "I'm done talking to you. I'm not selling anything to you. Get out of my shop." You know. Yeah. Uh, oh. So I, I do that a lot too. Yeah, and I I do want to clarify that this this isn't me. Picking up, picking on old old school or new school. I gen I generally um, I can I consider myself someone who is who does not fit within within either camp, but more of me um want wanting to dispel some of the romanticization myths that a lot that a lot of um people perpetuate. Mm -hmm. um, like I I've seen a lot I've seen a lot of people over overly ro overly romanticize um. Their, their their particular play style as as if it's as if it's some artistic experience and yeah for me with my play style i always try and make it clear in my own videos when i'm giving advice like this is what's worked for me your mileage may vary you know uh, i don't i i will make a judgment call on someone else's game and say something like that doesn't look fun to me i wouldn't enjoy that game but they're having fun so good for them you know don't piss uh, on another man's parade. Yeah, you know, like, and, and I think some people misinterpret that as like this one true wayism. Oftentimes, because we all take our games very I personally. Call, I call it designed by gospel, and yeah, if you want, if you want to see where that designed by gospel um, ends at, at its at its natural conclusion, I refer you to the state of sim racing video games over the, over the last few years. <laughs> That's a that's an area of gaming I'm not familiar with. So oh. is it uh, is it bad? <laughs> it is, it is very it is very um bec because of because of this fixation on quote unquote realism and and simulationism, mm. um, it's result it's resulted in a lot of stagnation, a lot of misplaced priorities, and um, a lo and a lowering of um of standard. I remember okay. the an example that I used is back in tw back in 2017, um, Project Cars 2 announced that um, it was going to ho it was going to host public lobby. It was going to have um, private lobbies for multiplayer. You could do that back on with Halo 2 back on the original Xbox in 2001. <laughs> <laughs> in t in the er in the early 2000s, private lobbies are not are nothing new, but ev but they were treating it as if it was this, as if it was this massive breakthrough, and uh. the and um and I've ta I've talked about this on a stream, but put but putting hours and hours of time into uh into rent into rendering the curvature of tires as they hit, as they hit the road isn't something that a lot of people are go <laughs> are going to care about, except for the most hardcore of gearheads, and. That this there and a lot of those things are done because people believe that that's what you have to do, or that that if you're doing it, if you're doing a racing that is meant that is meant to be more grounded that you have to use the exact same tracks that are you that are used in the current calendar of FIA approved motorsport. Like it, it, it's a matter of and this happens in role playing games too of over design almost or like you said focus on things that don't matter so much and then they, they end up other parts of the game end up lacking or just focus is put somewhere else that's actually not that important yep. 
um, you know, like, oh, like, roll to see how tall your character is. Like, who cares? You know, like... It's, well, like, yeah. the, thing, the thing that ends up being a turnoff for me when it comes to the... Um, when it came to the, when it came to a lot of the OSR discussion is so, is so much talk about um what get what Gygax and Arneson's intent intention was with cer with certain things or um or or how to or how to make it as um or how how to make it more how to make it more I guess more representative of 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 medieval cult of medieval culture the basically pulling the college know-it-all stuff mm -hmm. and um it's in times like these that are reminded of a remark by one of my by one of my colleagues jo um Joel Clark you play elf games <laughs> <laughs> stop taking it so serious yeah you know we do it for fun i i i take a special interest though in sort of the intention of some of the old rules because I think there's some neat stuff in there that is sort of forgotten or, or not forgotten, but people just don't use it anymore. And it's sort of like, well, why don't we use it? Is it actually bad? Like I'm, I'm genuinely curious yeah. as a as I think an with, I think with a lot of it, it's um, it do, it doesn't get used because there isn't enough of a reason to, or enough of a incentive to. I should I should say. But what getting back getting back to Mahahuito, um. What what would you be shooting for as far as a release window? The book's pretty much already done. There's just a few things I'm adding here and there. Like I think I'm gonna expand the the wilderness as a dungeon section a little more and add more stuff there. Maybe some tables to roll on for a referee uh, in that. Um, but it's pretty much done. So pretty. My goal is like once once the Kickstarter completes, everyone's yeah or or. You know, third days are up October 9th, I think. Once it ends, my goal is as soon as I possibly can get all the backers' names into the into the book and send out the digital to everyone uh, that backed it uh, right away. So you'll you'll hopefully get the PDF version right away. Then get the print on after a bit of time because there might be mistakes in there that I, I need to fix. And uh, having at this point, see, I have 400 backers. Having 403 pairs of eyes on on it that can find mistakes typos that sort of stuff uh i'm gonna try and give a little window there and then start working on getting print on demand and the offset print going uh, offset print is obviously going to take a bit more time uh, i'm getting these printed in lithuania so they got printed in lithuania and then i'm importing them into the states for distribution mm -hmm. but uh print on demand will be hopefully pretty quick because uh, I, you know, setting, setting stuff up on drive through RPG is not fun. I don't like their GeoCities level backend site. It's pretty awful as a creator. But I put up with it, and it gets the job done. That shouldn't take too long. And so print-on-demand will hopefully go out pretty quick. And then um, uh, offset print will hopefully... I'm shooting for hopefully, I'm hoping January, but it might be a bit later, who knows with shipping it's got to get on a boat across the ocean to get here so i'm um, hoping not too long the the company that prints this usually prints pretty quick you've talked to greg from chronicles of Iris before and i'm getting my books printed yeah. from the same same guy he used so. yeah i know yeah i know greg um <laughs> i'm i'm sure i'm sure that he's gonna show up in the temple again again soon <laughs> uh but yeah I, I have to thank greg greg too he gave me a lot of advice on, on a lot of the stuff and uh he, he's the one hooking me up with the printer that he used, and they've been great. So I have to I have to give Greg uh, some thanks and some props there because he's been very helpful. Good guy. Mm -hmm. Well, I will certainly be looking forward to seeing how it develops. But with all that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come all the way to my temple and enjoy <laughs> the madness that happens here. No, it was fun. It was a fun discussion. Thanks for having me on, man. It was uh, it's good times. So, uh, anytime you see fit to return, whether it's for, whether it's for more of um, a more of having a bloody good time. There's there's my blood joke. <laughs> <laughs> uh, or 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 just to um, just to laugh as the ra as the ranger gets downed once again. The <laughs> Or the or laugh at the barbarian kit from from AD and D for being kind of lame. 
<laughs> oh, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. <laughs> and of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody! <laughs>